So um, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jay Ponteri. I'm the program head of um, the Low Residency Creative Writing Program. I kind of forgot what that was. It's day nine of our residency. So um, we're all very um, wonderfully exhausted. Um, at the Pacific Northwest College of Art at Willamette. Um, thank you all for, for coming here. Um, tonight is our, our sort of special, special evening. Um, uh, we have three readers this evening. Um, one of them is um, on the Zoom machine and that's the incredible Vicky now. And two readers are in person. And that is Cedar Saigo and Julene Unsan Johnson. And um, I'd just like to thank Alberta Abbey for hosting us. Um, and in many ways, um, you know, this sort of combination hybrid, um, we're all just taking off our mask. It feels like our program in this moment gets to sort of experience the, the sort of cultural unmasking that's happening. Um, and, and how lucky we are to um, be in this moment. So thank you for, for attending. I, would, I am honored to introduce Rachel Keller, fiction writer, a member of the cohort who will be graduating next year in 2022. Um, she, Rachel, is going to be doing the introductions. Thank you, Rachel. Jay, so excited for this evening. Um, first up, we have Janine Unsun Johnson. Um, she was born in Seoul, South Korea. She was adopted and taken to Valdez, Alaska. Johnson is a McDowell County Fellow or Colony Fellow and the recipient of the Isabella Gardner Fellowship. She earned an MFA in Visual Studies from PNCA and an MFA in Creative Writing um, from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Johnson's work has been published in CERC a literary journal, Nervous Breakdown, the Rio Grande Review, Whiskey Island Magazine, the Dunes Review, the Indianapolis Review, Zone Three Trees, Neck Press, and other journals and anthologies. Her work is forthcoming in Poetry Northwest. Johnson read for Tender Table and House Poems Project. Johnson was the editor of special projects for Jubilee in fall 2020, spring 2021. She is the founder and editor of Trestle Ties, a landscape of emergence. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Janine. Hello. Oh, sorry, you can't hear me. Hi. Um, I usually do one thing before every reading. I don't think it, oh, it looks like I got everyone. So um, I'd like to thank Jay for having, having me and hosting me. And I'd like to thank PNCA for um, also hosting me and Willamette. Um, and I'd like to thank MK because um, she was my um, advisor and mentor in my first MFA program here at PNCA. So thank you for um, welcoming me back into the community after just arriving here uh, 13 days ago. Um, hard to believe, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, so thank you. And um, I'll be reading a little excerpt out of a nonfiction piece um, that I've been working on. <clears throat> Who is the owner of this space? Who is the owner of this place? Is this the space of the family, of the family, of your ancestors family, the family ancestors, the family ancestors, the land of the family, the land of the family, the land of the family of ancestors? The Athabascan speaking people of the Copper River Basin, Alaska Native, 
out of fishing, out of training copper, out of jade, out of furs. How can I come? How can I become again when all is lost? It's easy to get lost in this land. How can I hold time in this land, in this land? How can I hold space inside, inside, inside? Is this the family of my family? Is this the family of the family? Is this the family of your family? Are the crumbles of the building rotting down the building of the natives? Is this the land, the natives, the native land? Is this the family of the native in the land, in the land of crumbling building? Was the crumbling building the building of the natives? The building was a language in their tongue, lash of white on the huge white sign with red paint hardware store. Not the native language that was the building of the natives, was the natives that built the building. I carried the language of the white in the wind and the angle of the storm. Then the rotting building came down, came down with the force of bulldozers of the land and the owners of the building, owners of the lease of the land, of the lease and the white and the building that was not building, that was not for sale, that was not yours, that was not the news, that was not the land, that was no one's, not that was no one's, not that was no one's. This is the land, the land that echoes, the echoes that cries, the echoes, the land that cries, the land that cries and goes back to the land that echoes and the land and the land cries, cries back to the land that echoes and the echoes go back to the land and the cries and the cries and the echoes 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 in the crowd and the echoes and cries and the echoes and cries and the land closes in and the ghosts from the dead ancestors for the dead ancestors for the living for the dead that will die are the ancestors that are dead for my dead ancestors for your dead ancestors for the ancestors of the past for the ancestors of the future for the ancestors of the present no dad the ancestors the echoes have pets so this next piece um is after Philip Levine. Out of the last frontier, out of fishing nets and broken bottles of whiskey lining red bottomed tinned boats, brown glass strung on monofilament like brown glass floats. They feed their late night hunger with the permit out of ocean water and fish scales floating belly up, drowning in the sun, out of swollen bodies and wild wind waves, they feed thy feathered beast. They feed monsoon storms strumming out of the Gulf of Alaska, out of marble menthol lights by the curtains, out of pot packing long sticks together to out of packing long sticks down to the filter for taste, out of opening the box and taking two out only to flip one upside down for good luck. They feed the fat flames of luck. They feed a habit with flames of urns out of pressing the other one to lips before paying out of lighter snapped, out of fuse, out of lining hard, but not hard enough. Out of late night bonfires made from stolen pylons, out of teenagers smoking marijuana sticks as incense. They feed 
and they still fight. Out of ache blood, out of drunks, out of 5 a.m. smells, <laughs> out of 5 a.m. smells of juniper and pine, they feed the oil into tankers heading for China. They feed the oil into tankers, gas not refined on this soil, out of tugboats pulling out of kiss my ass, out of thin layer plastic protection without face masks, no breathing ventilation. They feed the poor to sludge through oil. They feed high water pants for fishing. No, sorry. <laughs> they feed the high, uh, they feed the high water pants for fish. Now knee deep in solution, they feed the gas pumps, they feed their government hookups out of 22 hour work days, out of fish can rot on road, rot, <laughs> out of, out of fish can rot on roading rotation belts, but the, but the cutters still cluster in five feet spaces out of never seeing the sky open, for it is always open in summer. And this next one is um, fruit flies out of liquor bottles. Um, so my parents owned um, businesses and um, so I pretty much grew up in a bar. Um, so this is, this is a poem out of that experience. Fruit flies out of liquor bottles. In my teens, I picked fruit flies out of liquor bottles. Sometimes black flies bellied up to the top, rising to the waves of earthquakes or steps of the same 25 people visiting velvet colored bar. Dollar bills lined rows of bar cabinets. My mom once danced on the bar during a Christmas party. My dad told her, left her. My dad left her. He said, that is no way to behave. It was the kind, it was, sorry, it was the way he performed the bar kind. Like actors on the like actors in the bar scene at the beginning of On Deadly Ground, the bar scene shot at my bar before I could ever attend a bar in real life. The scene that renewed the Exxon Valdez oil spill years, dad's Harley Davidson soft tail reinvented over time, custom chrome, bought with the earnings from the oil spill and childhood coin. Also made a debut in the film. The film was a failure. I was the only person to ride the motorcycle. Dad took me up and down Dedina Street. The street became a frozen lake in spring. Now was the glory street for the first motorcycle ride. Until years later, one day I drove Danny's motorcycle into a blackberry bush and began feasting on berries. Billy and his friends went to the bridge to nowhere. They all began looking for the motorcycle and my body. I spent 25 minutes waiting in the bushes to see if they would find me. They never did. I left the motorcycle and found the boys frantically looking for me. When I was eight, I saw Deb, the bartender, selling cocaine in the refrigerator. I was hiding from my brother, light on, behind a crate of Budweiser. In my 20s, I called Deb a bitch for calling the cops on me. I had had eight mixed drinks and a bottle of wine. Deb 86 me from my own bar. My mom never argues. Tender me. Have I ever told you a story? Yeah, you tell me stories all the time. Have you ever felt like dying? If you ever want to feel like dying, 
get dye pumped into your veins. Have you ever killed anything? I slaughtered a cow, put a bullet in its head. It fell over like a car crash. We cut its throat to spill the blood out. Tender meat, a drought to the heart. Did you see the marmot running in the yard? Is it the same one that runs through our yard? How do you know it's the same one? I don't know his name. He was taking photographs of the sky when he was driving. How do you know it was not an illusion? One time my brother was watching me while my mom and dad were at work. He pushed me off of the multicolored couch into the glass coffee table, the glass shattered. I think it was the most reasonable thing he's ever done. Phenomenology, windows, buck flies. This is no, sat no satire, symmetry, half plant, half gutter, space between brow and abstraction, brown and cordial, simulation, recreation. What is like, what is empty? Can you see full ball? Stretched out, seen as human, flush, flushed. And I, I think I'll do one, one more if I have. No, I think I'll leave it like that, just so I'm not, I don't want to bore anyone, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you Thank you so much, Julien. Up next, we have Vicky Now. Vicky Now's work includes poetry, fiction, film, play, and cross-genre collaboration. Nomadic and prolific by nature, she is the author of the novel Fish in Exile, the story collection A Brief Alphabet of Torture, winner of the 2016 FC2's Ronald Sue Kennick Innovative Fiction Prize, and of four poetry collections, Human Tetris, Sheet Machine, Umbilical Hospital, and The Old Philosopher winner of the 2014 Night Boat Prize. Her poetry collection, A Bell Curve is a Pregnant Straight Line, and her short story collection, The Vegas Dilemma, are forthcoming from 1111 Press Summer and Fall 2021, respectively. She holds an MFA in fiction from Brown University, and she was the Fall 2019 Fellow at the Black Mountain Institute. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Vicky now. Um. Thank you, uh, Rachel, for their warm introduction. And it was so wonderful to uh, go after Julie. I'm going to read from, um, oh, and thank you for being here. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to read from a little bit from each of my, um, the old philosopher. Um, the poem is called, uh, it's titled, My First Lover Said I Had a Small Tongue. My first lover said I had a small tongue and it was hard to friends kiss me. That there were three discs on my body that were softer than paper pesos. That I loved sour, sour, sour food. Unripe guavas and the essence. Or that you knew your voice would conquer the world. Or you knew something in you that was conquerable, that there was conquest in Spain and Cadiz and a strait of G, not G spot, mind you, Africa. Or that you knew there was no afterlife and I knew the meaning of life and I held a clavet to the universe. That were a thousand minds unwinding in the distance and the ozone layer is climbing the stairs from Babylon. 
or that you could speak Vietnamese if you wanted, and if I wanted to, or that the tongue was like a hammock, rocking the mouth in the heat, dividing the atmosphere and hemisphere, and there was no between us, or that you knew there was no windows in Tussauds, and there was no such thing as clave and clave and clave, or there was a lighthouse in the moon's backyard that the world did not spend, but spent its day sitting in Walmart's toilet, or that you knew I knew that love was made of dust and light, and maybe nails where the hammer walked away and then returned, or that you knew that spring was drying its wet fingers on the sleeves of winter's polo coat and that the snail was crawling slowly from my memory and sitting quietly on the throne of your memory or my memory was your memory and that the tongue has no infrastructure and the electricity was the lymphatic drainage. And then I'm going to read from um, my, uh, a piece from my, a short story from my wife, um, from my, um, from my collection, a brief, a brief alphabet of torture. And the story is called My Wife's Ears and Nose. The hours of disbelief rushed me, me to hold myself at the center. I've been holding myself together these long months, these ridiculous, silly years. There are times like this when cutting my wife's ears and nose wasn't enough. She kept on dishonoring me in ridiculously silly ways dishonoring my manhood, dishonoring my family, and my mothers won't stop complaining about her. She would return anyway, and of course you know how silly it is for a wife to leave her husband, and my penis would ache like those terrible moans at nights with stiffness and disorientation. And I would inhale and consider all things possible, what I would do to her. My family would approve, my mother in particular, Oftentimes my friend would ask, well, how did you cut them off? Did you wait until she fell asleep? Did you drug her? Did, you, did she struggle? Of course she struggled, thrashing about. And I had to pin her down like a ravaged animal. She was wide awake for it. And I would, with a kitchen knife, I hacked her first ear off. And before she realized what was happening to her, I forced her to face the other direction like how betrayal is the symbol of love. I hacked her other ear, like cutting a bull's ear off after a bullfight. Cutting her nose was harder. Pinching her nose for grip was the most natural exercise. Wasn't the most natural exercise. It was the altitude of her nose too. It was a predicament, the crunchy bone tissue. There were these amazing ways in which as the head of the household, I have to consider for my family's sake and for my future's sake. My life has drawn long like a water pipe and these long rivers that wash through me. Sometimes I listen to the secret voice of the earth, of the earth's face that hollow out and my fibrous fingers aching and muscle bound. I feel like a tree uprooting from my wife's sudden tor torturous ugliness. My wife wouldn't understand the kind of sacrifice I'd made for my family. I didn't want to cheat her face out of its beauty and grace and magnificence, but I had a duty to protect my inner community. A wife who runs away, someone has to take responsibility for her fugitive efforts. There are laws we men have to abide by, fundamental laws about family and community, the role each individual has in the community of hands and mouths and legs. How would she feel if I ran away too? Wouldn't she have the right to cut my nose off too? Cutting my wife's ears off gave me power. It made me important in the community and it made me untouchable to other men. They saw how I was a model citizen, a man of my word. They saw how quickly I was willing to defend the law of the community and how much I was willing to sacrifice for it. Even sacrificing my wife for it. It has been long and true that a wife's beauty isn't important and should be hidden away like a song. I sing this song privately to my lips in quiet long hours where not a soul knows. I sing a sad song for the small river that lives inside of my manhood. It breathes, runs, and expands. My wife should know that I love her, unbridled, 
these effortless hours that march to and fro between other armies of hidden men. And then the last piece that I'm going to read from is called A Bell Curve is a Pregnant Straight Line is my collection of poetry that's coming out press 1111 in about 17 days, give or take. It is launching on my birthday. Okay. So the poem that I'm going to read from is actually the title of the collection. A bell curve is a pregnant straight line. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I hope you had a wonderful residency and that even though tomorrow is the last day, I hope it has a lasting place in your literary consciousness. Thank you. So here it is. A bell curve is a pregnant straight line. What does coolness look like? A block of ice the size of an entire estate in Moscow, a cubic foot of cloud with corners touching and sensing its own border like a nebulous blind sitting in an invisible cage made of atmosphere. What if I were to pull you into my arms, would you drop into a bullet because you feel the weight of it, your toes? Or would you float between the awning of my armpit because the lightness of my awning held your non-aromatic nostril together like a doorknob? Perhaps you feel the weight of my kiss merely because you are in my arms sliding up and down like a teardrop that has climaxed to the tip of your forehead hair. When I held you in my arms, I felt the levity of lead and the density of your tears. After all, you had been crying, and when I held you, pull you not like a thread to tooth, to tooth, but like a forklift to snow. When I held you in my arms, you arched your body backward, just a little, or maybe you are light like a summer equinox. When your tears fall on my blouse, your sea sits like a stone on the throne of a human river. You are at home painting over Cezanne. In my arms, you are mistaken, your tear dropped, I mean, or was it your window of opportunity, which was maybe a mistake because my armpit isn't a cockpit. Crying is not an act of light for cats, for chimpanzee, or is it? When you begin to cry, you are descending toward the mountain in your solar plane of solitude, confusing anthropization for a clinic box. You pull on my sleeve and you sob a little into it. Later, when your wrist is aware of itself, it feels a pull of gourmet nasal output, definitely, definitely made of mucus, two hours of sobbing. Sitting wet on my sleeve, I think I learned to elbow chicken thighs by submitting to chicken thighs. You asked your mother if you could color her underwear with the melancholy of tomorrow while your friends chill out with diaper rash Sometimes your mothers borrow underwear from your grandfather and your grandfather lays on. Sorry, I digress some. What I mean to say is that it is not okay in winter to cry on my sleeve. Summer is okay and maybe spring because when that pool of mucus turns itself into one slab of ice, my bloodstream from the regional sleeve stops moving to my fingertips. When my blood stopped moving itself around in that area, it means that my hand from that glacial sleeve won't function anymore. So to undo one, to undo your bra, I have to exert several Newton laws. It's like a million tons of my, what my head feels like or empty like a gun without any bullets. Maybe I should be clear to my audience why my beloved had been crying on our first date. That day she learned that she had breast cancer at the age of a quarter of a century, or better put, a perfect cube, because I'm black, tall, thin, and European, ready to fuck anything supreme and cancerous. At least that's what my OK Cupid profile declared when she met up with me. That human block of exquisite human eyes in feminine form and cancerous. My OK Cupid is not OK. When I said cancerous, I meant the astrological sign like Scorpio or Pisces or Taurus, not actually cancer itself. I had wanted to unclasp her bra to face the two dying birds that sat on the fabric railing of her chest. Throughout the dinner, I had no idea they were sitting on the edge of that railing 50 stories high on that skins of hers. 
thinking about jumping, planning her final suicide. Does it, it take cancer to make a date meaningful? Maybe that's what it's like to be submissive before two dying wing biopedal anthrodermic egg laying knockers dressed in banana leaves bras. When I gaze at her breast, I think of the Twin Towers. When it first came down, I imagined this is the future. I knew in this quasi Arabian night that it was an accident, this thing that came to her deformed. I knew cancer was a terrorist attack on a mammary glance. I have known in this state of shock as I was holding her. What is terrorism but an imbalance of suit and ash and fallen cement stone? Why do you have bras made of banana leaves in the middle of Denver, Colorado, I asked her. She replies that banana leaves are great placemats for her breasts and she says that Google said that banana leaves are large, flexible and waterproof. And I think of the both of us as I hold her hand. I think dates like this, I do not feel like a black queen standing next to her pearly white queen as a queen as well as she proceeds to check me with her dying cancerous gaze. I am in, cor in my corner with my lonely eyes and my lonely stone of a heart. My king is eating breakfast without me dying as we speak. This ruin, this teardrop on suit creating a hole in the atmosphere, the window in which formed this tenderness, I am on my knees, my tongue reaching to confirm the darkness of her skin, beautiful, hypnotic, enchanting as my tongue licks the tips of her nipples as if my tongue were a lighter, lighting two candles made of human milk and desire. When the wicks Pink like cherry, stand up straight, burning like eternal votive. I know terrorism doesn't wear a brazier, which is a fancy way of saying to blow things up and out proportion to bow down low to training bras, which is radiation, which means to take off one bra is to take Boeing 767-200 ER. I pull her into my arms and she sob into them as if I were a cave. I pull her into the symmetrical ruin, the home of my heart, in which there were these warning signs, these alarm bells when she wore that shirt. I swore something was wrong when I unbuttoned each her bra made of banana leaves stitched together by blue synthetic thread, the claps. I hold her, I told her, your female form is a jungle as the banana leaves fell on the edge of that memory foam before rowing their angulated cups into themselves so that they look like two nodes of headphones, containers of tropical mammary music were getting to know their concave selves better. If you must face an echo while you are an echo, why not be a symposium for two cancerous pearly introverts? Why not let Play-Doh play around with her female Play-Doh with rhetorical necklaces, logical tits, ma mathematical mammalias? If an echo has to find its soulmate in a concave proscenium such as a cup of a bazir, why not let Bethlehem Symphony Number no. 5 to be the synthetic altitude of a kiss as I kiss every centimeter of her skin while she sobs into me, my armpit, my cockpit, my spit, anything that rhymes with the human pit. The tits are exposed to light. The cups of the bras are turning their twins concave satellites. The cup of the bras, even if they were to fold their cups together as if to collapse for the hidden symphony of the heart, the vow, a trombone blowing the blood vessels into euphoria of lemon and cadence. When I pull her into my arms, my body blows out all her candles. In the darkness, my skin is spray painted with the white wet suit of her breast expiration dates. The expiration dates of some indefinite future between the yearning to hold and the craving to desire. Before I can say anything comforting, her tears reach into my ribs and pull out every single breath out of my chest like pulling an innocent child out of hiding in that closet made only for trembling bone marrow. In my arms, her eyelids grow heavy when her eyelashes comb the crooked floor of my neck. Something tells me this is how a gravel road is formed for modern trafficking and training ground and preparation for the exploitation of one single landscape. Where do I want her now as I turn to 
turned to a kettle to make her a cup of tea. Now that she stopped sobbing and a quarter of a century is sprawled out on my bed sheets, and that quarter of a century had fallen asleep on my bed sheets. A sob is the voice of a teacup which has lost its handle. Even when hot at boiling point, the cups wants to be held, not to get warm or warmer, but to possess the opportunity to cool down. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, V. Up next, we have Cedar Saigo. He was raised on the Squamish Reservation in the Pacific Northwest and studied at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at the Naropa University. He is the author of eight books and pamphlets of poetry, including Language Arts, Stranger in Town, Expensive Magic, two editions of Selected Writings, and most recently, the Bagley Wright Lecture Series book, Guard the Mysteries. He has taught workshops at St. Mary's College, Naropa University, and University Press Books. He is currently a mentor in the Low Residency MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. He lives in Lopal, Washington. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Cedar. see anyone. I just want to say, uh, first of all, thank you to Juline and to V. Thank you so much for your readings. And to everyone at PNCA, I've had a wonderful uh, few days here. Specifically, thank you to Jay and Justin, to Sarah, MK, and Megan, and to my friends uh, that I made in class over the last two days. Um, I am gonna read from my new book, uh, Guard the Mysteries. And I think I'm gonna read from the second lecture in the book. Um, I'll read an excerpt from it. And then I'll read a few poems to close. Um, but the second lecture in the book is titled um, Becoming Visible. And it's one of the two sort of autobiographical pieces in the book. and. Um, it starts with a quote by, I guess, my favorite poet, John Wieners. Poetry is the most magical of all the arts, creating a lifestyle for its practitioners that safeguards and supports them. Along the way to becoming an artist are many pitfalls. For those who do not write, do not know what true magic is. Many today become artists by adopting their looks and gear or else adhering around or to those who do practice this satisfaction. I cannot imagine a single day when I have not spent dreaming or conjuring certain habits of the poet. Fortunate the few who are forced into making things surrounding the poets come true. I couldn't help but think of my parents when I read that last sentence. My father, Charles Saigo, is a photographer and for a time was the curator archivist for the Suquamish Museum. My mother, Lynn Ferguson, is a musician, specifically a singer. Both of them have always kept to a high personal standard as well as maintaining a depth of belief in the arts. They allowed for a romantic tradition. Being an artist seemed to be more about continuous practice and execution rather than blindly applauding every effort. In Suquamish, certain native artists would hurry into assigning themselves the title of master carver, painter, singer. My parents would sometimes joke about this. My mother seemed obsessed with the architecture behind the singing voice. She often spoke of diction, pitch, and phrasing and pointed out when singers held too much tension in their voices. But she would also take care to point out those musicians who offered an uncanny personal style, one that can break rules and render them useless, 
as in the later Billie Holiday recordings of the 50s? Is our idealized voice, in fact, a ruin, wherein the knowing of the instrument eventually transcends its physical strength? My mother was also beholden to her first voice teacher, George Peckham. She kept a notebook of his sayings. I met him once or twice when I was eight or nine, played around in his house and backyard when my mother came into the city for a lesson, a tune-up. It seemed an unfastening, really, or a granting of permission. I remember when he died, I attended the funeral. His daughter, Lucy, played a solo cello piece. The hall was so crowded with singers and no one sang a note. My father put together the Eyes of Chief Seattle exhibit for the Suquamish Museum in 1983. His own photographs of reservation life in the early 1980s were hung alongside prints of Edward Curtis, same location and people, but without the Victorian staging. He had the archive situated behind the museum, cataloging baskets, stone artifacts, and blinders of contact sheets. He and my mother both conducted interviews with the Suquamish elders when the tribe had been awarded an oral history grant in 1980. My mother edited our tribal paper for years. Despite their highlighting of Suquamish history, they never cast our struggle as belonging to the past. In fact, their message seemed to be that misfortune often arises whenever we stop struggling. My father organized our annual powwow, Chief Seattle Days, as well as an indoor art fair every spring. Chief Seattle Days has been celebrated every year since 1911. It obviously was not celebrated last year. Um, my father has always kept his hair long to his waist, but he has never claimed to be the most traditional, to know the most songs or dances or rush to summarize our history. It seemed he would rather leave it open-ended. At the same time, he has always he has also kept a black and white record, a family tree for the Saigo family, hand drawn and typed and taped together, which still hangs on the long wall of his living room. I have always thought my father's photography seemed in line with Robert Frank, maybe even Larry Clark a bit. There was a dark room at the tribal center located just off of the archives. I remember being very young, maybe five, and waiting outside until my father said I could come in and being bathed in the red light. Let's see how the light plays out. That seemed to be his premise. Plus documenting our intimate and ever evolving Suquamish history that gesture dates well in photography, provided you have an eye. The interiors of my father's house and mine are almost identical. We laugh about it now. LPs, flyers, hand-drawn by friends and framed. Seasonal shrines. The act of assemblage, breathing softly in well-appointed rooms. And um, now there's a poem just called Things to Do in Suquamish. Smoke salmon, call San Francisco, like totally. Get driven to the terminal, escape. Come back after dark and feed the horses. Alfalfa, Timothy, oats, pick their hooves. Visit the Suquamish Museum. The eyes of Chief Seattle are shut, his spirit to himself. Sepia tones, baskets, white hot rocks, cobalt trade beads. Say hi to all my cousins, cul-de-sac. Hi, Josh. Hi, Jeremy. Drink Rainier beer, a red ribbon out, up, and over the peak. I confuse it with Mount Fuji. Walk back to dad's room. He talks when he wants and smokes. Linger over his bookshelf. Moby Dick, Starling Street, all of Kurt Vonnegut. Try and write the serial killer light at night see through green and black, give up, try prose. I would be remiss if I didn't speak a bit more on Chief Seattle as he was buried in Suquamish. His dates are circa 1780 to June 7, 1866, 
Some people say 1870. He was the, the chief of both the Suquamish and the Duwamish, two kingdoms separated by the Puget Sound. His famous speech was delivered in 1854 in Lachutzee, the native language of the Suquamish, and dictated on the spot by Dr. Henry Smith into Chinook jargon, which was a composite of native French and Indian words. It is said that it was delivered on the occasion of a visit by the recently appointed governor, Isaac Stevens. This is from the last part of Dr. Smith's translation. And when the last red man shall have perished from the earth and his memory among the white man shall have become a myth, these shores will swarm with the invisible dead of my tribe. And when your children's children shall think themselves alone in the fields, the store, the shop, upon the highway, or in the silence of the pathless woods, they will not be alone. In all the earth, there is no place dedicated to solitude. At night, when the streets of your cities and villages will be silent and you think them deserted, they will throng with returning hosts that once filled and loved this beautiful land. The white man will never be alone. Let him be just and deal kindly with my people, for the dead are not powerless. Dead, did I say? There is no death, only a change in worlds. Its dictation was obviously haunted with the element of poetry from the start, but it sounds to me more like Baudelaire than any possible American source, maybe Edgar Allan Poe. It feels rooted in imagery as much as in rhetoric. In fact, it is the animation of his imagery that makes the threat of being haunted believable. Native prayers have always sound like poetry to me, even when delivered in English. We thank the elements so resoundingly, you feel the gravitational waves around the words as they are spoken. That is still the manner of address in Suquamish. It is also freely acknowledged that all art is a form of medicine. My father rarely spoke of spiritual matters, but when he did, he used the term the creator as other Suquamish families often did. We believe in the creator. I think I was always taken with that term haunted by the responsibility of making poems and drawings. I saw a like-mindedness in the poet Charles Olson's statement, I am a maker of poems. And now to test out those theories on poetry. Uh, this is called uh, On Distortion. Welcome everything in using both cursive and print in the same paragraph, or voluminous examples of cross-writing during civil war when paper turns scarce. When the words do not resolve but plank and die next to each other, arbitrary actions leveled at flagstones in architecture, resetting our margins after the poem has already been typed into emotional paragraphs a hovering form of distortion that we die and only the recordings will go on existing, who filled my head with such dark and exceedingly separate stars, ghosts I lifted along the turns of wandered roads, ahead of the game, behind the times. We regret our early books for their lack of innate distortion, a dead yellow breeze onto the gold coin floor show, molten lights. When he faints from terror, she busies herself, a crinkling irritation, violin, electric black. A writer is a foreign country coated in ritual dust. I mistrust my neighbor's children, all government. They have come out as a terrible person in droves. I welcome you into the sound of repeating our demands as distillate, archive, plumes of coal smoke simply the time it takes for the bank to form above us. Living goes on to resemble its cure and setting that against John's line, sexual facts are tiring too. I dreamt Christopher Smart as the escaped lunatic hero who begins to detain fascist after fascist through force. Shadows of iron lace, 
St. Peter's Street and Royal for the final chase. For I will consider my sonnets unconnected, titled and dull forever after this, fluttering after, full of worry. I will keep blowing out this brutalist stricture in music, demanding a dynamic in language that mirrors the mind is insanity, a common distortion, where there is no actual clash and surrender. It's every day and still has a sprung enclosure effect. Orange and black wall falls over two pages. I make endless destroyed works as they will make the best poetry, exquisite, half forgotten, a torn tissue, four to eight specks of unequal green. Solarium. Uranium tinged black opal like truth. We demand the end of money as poetry demands unemployment. Always in deference to the received, freakish over imagined conduct, nightmare alleyway. It's the signature tick, the demon guardian you must slide past with your tongue that morphs as you age. Sometimes writing is waiting for a panel of clouded glass to come clean. Did I dream Sophie Tauber art as a silhouette sweeping a pile of Swiss francs? I remember asking workers to remove the microphone from the round room, big mistake, which the gallery may have taken as a traditional choice. Colossal visions twitch imposing variation in rhythm, the forest through the city and back. What if I am already dead, calm and feeling undivided? I will have to begin to make art in the old ways to even fake at breaking even, attempt to form daylight or sing to myself and choose to retrace it. Old threads of yellow varnished, blown to the edge of a white ravine. The scene is such, the wall itself is torn. And uh, this is a poem um, in memory of Diane de Prima, a spiral and a star. Driftwood, bright white, turns the flame blue at its base. Diane's slight shake and dry mouth. I watched her turn young again, and then a bit drawn and whimsical as we became reacquainted. Put to work at her bedside, transcribing new revolutionary letters, dawn poems, snares that are set to explode across centuries into further collapse, Dream after Christ church, after Freddie Mercury writhing up against your ear. Turn heretic and teach me the changes, elated deep in dream, where I might find you turning again, slender to the night. I've been writing a lot of poems for poets uh, as they pass, as I, always seem to do. And this one is for Kevin Killian. It's called Cancel Culture, the Bardo. Last supper in skateboard triptych, 99 billion cents with aching coral pink rubbed too hard over Paul's knockoff shoulder vest, a crippled offense. The one that is just Christ beheaded 112 times, Christ wandering out in Martha, spacing at Beacon trotted out again upon the ramparts. We walk happily spreading the Jack Spicer gospel of endless Rainier drinking. When lights out begins the thrill of furniture moving above you at 2 a.m. I cry like a baby as if reading sheltered language writing in empirical infancy. You're making millions of copies at work to offer us all the way back in, past hallucinations, cabaret cards, degrees, Back alley, queer, field of crosses, acres of VHS, the quilt. Anselm Berrigan reading your favorite ghost town aloud at double happiness. I am tripping over the entirety, your own strains of magic thrown back on Ed Dorn and Tom Clark. 
That is to say, naming names and Cecilia recording and me amiably hostage again with nothing to do but stand behind you, eyes averted, mouthing back the words. And I'll read one more poem. Um, it's called The Prisoner's Song, and it's mostly made up of uh, other native voices, um, some alive, some dead. Um, one, uh, there are places I use my own language, but they're very few. And there's one quote I like to point out, um, which is by Joy Harjo, the current poet laureate of the US. And her quote is, not to reverse history, but to draw out the strength. The Prisoner's Song. The third arrow flew upward and stuck. We rode back. Sunbirds redeviled the great stem, its reflected words. Fast thunder, hills, a molten mass, small clouds of stones, green rushes, waylaid spirits onto lava beds. Post removed, stone broken, face turned down to earth. I dropped out the little hangnail blanket of a door, sun strapped to my back so everyone could feel I was sinking. I dried out, woke up, sprouted wings, and flew away. Looking glass is dead. The circular blue paper is the sky. We see some green spots which are pleasing. Are the commissioners clear as I am? I gave them a blue flag, which they pretended to cherish. I live in hopes. I do not have two hearts. The Illinois River will rise, a single warrior to write beyond without me. Death at the hands of the long guns. Did I say death or the springs are drying up? Find the break where blood runs clear. Through the love you bear your gallant little band not to reverse history, but to draw out the strength. Right in the corridor to be no speaking, sing in the hall to be no dancing, cry in the street to be no leading, break into the house to be no sleeping, feel in the closet to be no running, fight in the dome to be no screaming, lie down in the dark to be no changing. Are the commissioners clear as I am? The dampness of night pierces my shield. Two dead men push a stick through my buttonhole. The sun looks down on me as complete. I want you to look and smile, red with iron black. With all of my heart, I thank my black robed friends for their kindness. Columns of steel rise. I was glad to hear the black robes had given you the sh this shimmer of elongated nights left to waver in the void. They know how to die in battle. They are a twist in the black mirror, that river between the city and the mist. We will produce no same men again. They come back different and the same. They roam over hills and plains and wish the heavens would fall. You issued the first soldiers, and we only answered back, seeking air. I have sent many words that were drowned along the way. The wind is full of bottles and the air aggressive, a red feather placed into black hair. Thank you. To get up here. Thank you everybody for coming this evening. Let's have another round of applause for our readers. And thank you to Rachel Keller for doing our introductions and thank you all for attending in the room and on Zoom. Tomorrow night is um, our final evening of the residency. Um, our final reading of thesis um, candidates. 
um, begins at five o'clock tomorrow. And then at 6.30, we have the inaugural graduation of the Low Residency Creative Writing Program. So that will be at 6.30. Thanks again.